here's an outline of the of the lecture. Um, I'm, I'm, one of the other things I want to do in this lecture, and in fact we both wanted to do day one, was frame the, the rest of the days of the week, introduce uh, a kind of an overall plan of uh, solving direct problems, inverse problems, which are much more difficult, come later in the week. Um, and so I'm going to talk about a lot of different things, not in a great deal of detail, and then pointing to the future where you'll hear, hear more about them. But first, I'll talk about uh, the two major categories of tissue problems, uh, some basic light propagation models, uh, prototype problems, this, by this I mean standard ones that require measurements and, you know, what, what sort of output. Vasan already told you, uh, you collect light maybe internal uh, or you, you uh, collect light at the surface, depending on whether you're doing therapeutics or diagnostics. There are very few equations in transport that can be solved analytically, but there is one that's very useful. I'll talk about that. Um, and then I'll go into the ideas that underlie the simulation generation itself and talk about how you can tell whether the simulation you've conceived is going to solve the radiative transport equation that you have written down. So it's the equivalence between the probabilistic model, which is the Monte Carlo model, and the analytic or the physical model described by transport. And then a look ahead at inverse problems. Okay. <coughs> Uh, here, are, here are the fundamental problems of light tissue interactions in biomedical applications. The forward problem, as you can see, this is a concept slide I took from Carol's lecture. Uh, thank you, Carol. I liked it. <laughs> um, uh, the forward problem takes you from the input parameters, uh, optical parameters, physiological parameters, to a model like the radiative transport equation, and then finally to the predictions of measurements that you intend to make. So that problem is what's called well-posed. That means that it has a unique solution and the solution depends continuously on the input data. In other words, if you change mu A or mu S a little bit, the solution doesn't change very much either. So there's a continuous dependence. Very nice property. Uh, the inverse problem is anything but that. Uh, you start on the right-hand side. You're given a set of optical measurements and you'd like to predict the parameters that describe the tissue that gave rise to those measurements. So again, the model that you use, let's use transport as the standard model for us, uh, the measurements are put into the model and techniques are used to extract predictions. And this problem, by contrast with the forward problem, is what is called ill-conditioned, which means that there may be actually no solution or more than one solution. And there is theory that cements that uh, convincingly. The so-called similarity theory will betray that property. So. These are the big picture problems in the field. Uh, now I'm going to 
try to explain for those who so uh, understand this sort of abstract notation. Uh, I'm trying to just write out how you formulate these problems in an abstract way. So if the set of input parameters is called capital I, and here they are, mu t, mu s, q, the physical source, p is the scattering phase function, n is the refractive index, gamma is the phase space, boundary conditions, initial co conditions, and the f's describe placements of detectors. So we might have capital D detectors. You need all of that to prescribe a problem. And then the output is going to be determined from this set of D measurements. D is the number of me measurements. That's the number of detectors. So the forward problem then takes you from the space of measure of input parameters i to the space of output parameters. It's a mapping. Uh, and the inverse problem is an inverse mapping that takes you from the measurements to input. Um, now, the key to understanding why one is so much easier than the other is to look at uh, something called the norm. This, uh, this function, which maps i into o, is, is an operator. As such, it has a norm. We can associate a size with it. And that norm is strictly less than 1 because there is attrition of light. And without fluorescence, there's no production of light. So the typical case is that norm is less than 1. Or the map is contractive. It squishes the space of I into a smaller space of O, if you can think of it that way. But the opposite map is greater than 1. That should, that should not be norm of O. That should be F inverse. So norm of F inverse is greater than 1. That's, this means the forward problem is well posed and the inverse problem is ill conditioned because things get magnified when you go the other way. And in fact, you don't even have to have a solution, much less a unique solution. Now, it's important to notice that F, the map, depends on all the details of the problem you're solving. Uh, the model and the strategy you use to implement the model. So um, this is kind of a background item that tells you we can anticipate problems when we get to inverse solutions, but we have ways to solve them nonetheless. OK, so starting with the forward models, um, and going back to the five-layer stack that Vasan introduced, this is the VTS virtual tissue simulator system that our virtual photonics uh, developers have developed. Um, it's an open source system. It's meant to be accessed from a desktop computer anywhere in the world via the internet. Uh, the problem definition layer, the bottom layer in blue, tells you, describes the, the problem input, as you might imagine. Um, and in the series of laboratory exercises we have, there are two this afternoon. The first one will use the VTS uh, GUI interface. Uh, and its spectral panel to explore tissue absorption and scattering spectra. Now, you'll be told uh, how to operate in a general way the VTS components, the GUI and command line to some extent, by Lisa and Carol, who will be prefacing the labs with this tutorial. Um, <clears throat> the solver layer selects which, which model you want to use to determine the solution, the radiance. Uh, electromag EM, 
electromagnetic radiative transport or standard diffusion approximation. These are all important models uh, and of course it matters greatly which one you pick. So the solution, as Vassen said, if you have L solution, I've left off time dependence, but you can imagine it's a six-dimensional function with three position vectors, components, two for unit direction and T time, a six for time. Uh, if you have that, then in general, all the output quantities are writable as weighted integrals of that radiance. And for example, I, he showed a, a formula of, for fluence rate, which is an integral over omega, over all directions of L. Um, and reflectance is another uh, weighted integral of the solution. So in principle, you have everything you need if you have the, the radiance. <clears throat> In this lecture, we're going to pretty much uh, focus on stochastic models, that is, lab Monte Carlo solving. And in lab B this afternoon, you'll use a different GUI panel, the Monte Carlo solver panel, to illustrate features of simulation. Get some feel for what it's like to generate uh, a smallish number of photons and observe things about them. <clears throat> but I don't want to give zero emphasis on standard diffusion and approximations like that. So what I'll say very quickly is that analytic solvers like standard diffusion are very, very important and especially historically in the biomedical literature. This was the beginning of the work in this field. Uh, based on diffusion theory. Uh, typically, if you have a closed form analytic solution, a formula for the radiance as a function of input, uh, you'll be able to sometimes write an exact solution to those specialized equations, but only if the tissue is simple. Uh, typically, if it's homogeneous, or if it's layered in a simple way, and then you can provide rapid computational algorithms, both forward and inverse. And so in terms of speed, uh, there's no way to beat analytic solving. However, <clears throat> when they're used to estimate a completely general solutions, there is really no rigorous way to estimate the approximation error. There are some, some ways of getting at it, but there, it's very difficult to estimate the difference between the rigorous solution and the approximation produced by SDA. And so that's a, that's a, a defect of use of the method. So uh, here's another way of looking at uh, analytic solvers, and in particular the standard diffusion. If you if you insist on trying to get closed form solutions, I said you must restrict to simple geometries and also simple boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are very important in differential equations like the diffusion equation. But it does produce fast formula-driven solutions and most importantly, it's accurate when the reduced scattering is very much larger than absorption. So when scattering is dominant and when the depths in tissue that you want to interrogate are sufficiently uh, great removed from sources. Now, the biggest defect, as we've been saying in responding to various questions, is that the standard diffusion 
cannot capture the full directional dependence of the light field. In particular, it gives you the first angular moment and not in any higher ones unless you use Henry Greenstein scattering, in which case the first moment determines the higher ones. Uh, by contrast with uh, the analytic solvers, stochastic solvers produce statistically fluctuating solutions. So you get a solution a n bar. The bar is meant to be a mean, a sample mean. Uh, and sigma n is the standard deviation after n photons are launched. Uh, fluctuating solutions of the exact RTE equations. And if the estimator is what we call unbiased, and I'll talk about that more later, it means that the approximate solution converges to the real solution as the number of photons launched gets indefinitely large, which means that the variance or the standard deviation goes to zero. Uh, the standard deviation is a, is a way of measuring error in Monte Carlo simulations, but the more usual one, a more sensible one, is one that's dimensionless called figure of merit. It's the product of n, the number of photons launched, and the variance, the square of the standard deviation. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, the way sigma sub n would go to zero is like one over square root of n. So if you square it, the variance goes to zero like one over n, and that means dimensionally these, that product is dimensionless. Okay, so the figure of merit gives you a nice dimensionless way of comparing the efficiencies, the computational efficiencies of two simulations that use different numbers of random walks and run in different times. Uh, its general properties, pros and cons, are these. Uh, there are no restrictions on the problem complexity at all. If you can describe the tissue as a nice homogeneous or even continuously varying uh, set of refractive indices, complicated tissue, a complicated geometry, uh, you, can, you can describe that in Monte Carlo at, with the input layer. Um, and the accuracy increases with increasing n, but the convergence is slow. That's certainly not a, uh, that certainly is a consideration. Um, but the error is very easy to estimate from the sample values. Just as you get a sample mean, which is your uh, approximation to the solution, you get a sample standard deviation, which is your approximation to the rigorous standard deviation. And so it's very easy to write those down, and therefore you get some feel for the statistical fluctuations as a function of n. Um, and that is why it's because of these general properties that Monte Carlo is often thought of as the gold standard for RTE solutions. If you have a Monte Carlo simulation that is faithfully executing the radiative transport equation and an unbiased estimator, then you have an expectation that although it may take time the way you're doing it, you'll converge to the right answer. Well, that's, a, that's a big plus. Now, this is a little different way of getting at the prototype problems that Vasan outlined <coughs> with a more general kind of description. But we saw that all metrics relevant to therapy and diagnostics are expressed as weighted integrals of the radiance. And the weighting function here I've called f. And f can take various forms. For example, when he illustrated with the fluence rate, f was uh, the identity function. 
and all you were doing is integrating L with respect to omega. So you're integrating the radians over all directions and you get the fluence rate. On the other hand, when you have a detector on the surface of the tissue, then as he said, you're capturing only the amount of light that escapes through the top surface and that's a different, that defines a different function, f. And uh, we'll, we'll see that in just a moment. So this is an important characteristic that Vasen stressed, therapeutics or diagnostics. Um, the nice thing about Monte Carlo is that it can easily extract properties from the interior of tissue. Well, not easily, but it can uh, by putting virtual detectors where the targets are. But of course, one can't measure them non-invasively. One has to do invasive measurements. Here are um, links in a way to the future this week. Uh, spatially resolved diffuse reflectance or transmittance is be covered in day four, uh, lecture seven and eight. Uh, the function R is called the um, reflectance as a function of rho, which is the distance between the sources and the detectors. Here I'm showing a single source and multiple detectors. And I'm trying to get a, a spatial resolution uh, from that. Rho here is the sum of squares of x and y. So it's the square of the radius of the circle. S, S2 with a minus sign is the unit sphere, but only half of it. It's the hemisphere of exiting directions. Since we normally Think of the plus sign as z increasing down here. <clears throat> now, the variables and parameters of interest to vary in order to do a good job with these measurements are the distance between sources and detectors. I think you know kind of intuitively if you put detectors very close to sources, then the light field tends to be shallow from the source to the detector and you don't get interrogation of deeper tissue. Whereas if you move them farther apart, you will get a deeper penetration of tissue. And so that's this, that distance is a critical parameter. And also the number and locations of those detectors so that they're sensitive to the parameters you're trying to measure. In practice, uh, light is not collected over a whole hemisphere, but over a reduced uh, numerical aperture, it's called, which is the detector's uh, window of angle collection, and small surface areas that include the desired values of the source detector separation. So we would write that something like this. Uh, as a function of uh, a mesh in rho and in angle, the approximate derivative uh, integral of the radians at the surface, z equals zero, with respect to omega and with respect to rho. So we're looking at segmented output space, and that's our measurement in this case. In time resolved diffuse reflectance, you'll learn about that on the last day, I guess, Friday, when there's a discussion of diffusive uh, light. Uh, you're interested in a time integration of the uh, this function, and again, with a mesh that looks like this, an integration over, again, direction and time over a certain interval. And 
if you have a time de you to get a time dependent measurement you have to have a time dependent light source so normally you'll have a pulsed light source that arrives then at each detector at different times in homogeneous tissue that's equivalent to arriving there with different distances having been traveled because the velocity is constant the velocity of light is assumed to be constant in tissue and so distance and time are in one-to-one -one correspondence <clears throat> So for both spatially and time-resolved measurements, you need to avoid redundancy, which is wasteful of your resources, and you need to put in the detectors intelligently where they will do the most good. So sort of a, a very naive idea is, well, let's place one detector close to the source and another one far from the source, and then we'll have an idea of of the two kinds of light paths. But there are refinements of that that can be analyzed with the software in VTS system. Um, now I'm going to talk a, a bit about exact radio transport solutions, uh, and in particular a family of one-dimensional uh, RT equations that can be solved in closed form uh, and and remarkably they're not only useful because we know exact solutions and therefore can estimate Monte Carlo errors exactly but they provide a pretty good guide to behavior in three dimensions as well with some notable important exceptions um, so this is a family I'll introduce now, and then Wednesday's lectures will will uh, recall it and and do more with it in different ways. <clears throat> Here's a uh, a problem you'll find in the book, the big pur purple book of Welsh and von Gemmert. If you don't know it, you should get familiar with it. It's kind of a handbook on on uh, our field uh, and volume two was recently published this is the first volume 95 okay here's the slab I've uh, I'm assuming that there is only one directional scattering as sources are introduced on the left orthogonal to this surface and particles can move straight left or they can scatter backwards or they can be transmitted or reflected. They can also be absorbed internally. So there are three possible fates for every particle. I launch, it gets through, it's transmitted. It doesn't, it's reflected, or it's absorbed, it's lost in the tissue. <clears throat> uh, if I, in a one-dimensional case, I have a very limited in what sort of angular distribution I can describe for a scattering phase function. Basically, I only have two delta functions available. A delta function pure forward, mu is the cosine of the scattering angle. So when the cosine is one, you have pure forward, and when it's minus one, you have backward. And the coefficients pf and pb are arbitrary they add up to one. There are probabilities of forward and backward scattering. They add to one and their difference turns out to be g. If you want to verify that for yourself, it's a nice little exercise. You just multiply this function uh, by, uh, let's see, by mu, by mu, and integrate. And you'll get g out of pf minus pb. Now, here, you know, however you want to think of it, this is a pair of coupled differential equations that describes the problem. One describes the forward moving solution, the other describes the backward moving solution, and they're coupled in a fairly complex way through the scattering. 
but it can be solved in closed form. The coefficients are constant, so two ordinary differential equations with constant coefficients can be solved by writing uh, exponentials for each component and figuring out what the decay rate lambda is. So C1, C2, D1, D2 will depend on the input data and lambda, which is the characteristic decay rate in one dimension, turns out to be this quantity, the square root of absorption times the tra transport cross-section. And keeping in mind that you know, you'll want to look back at this when there's more discussion of diffusion, this decay rate is different from that in diffusion. So that's, it does not predict faithfully that, or putting it the better way, the SDA doesn't predict faithfully the, def the decay rate in transport. Okay, so here are some solver ideas. Now we're getting into the practical matter of launching photons and solving a Monte Carlo problem. <coughs> uh, so we assume that the radius of transport equation describes the average behavior of photons, an ensemble of photons, which is stochastically varying. The coefficients mu t, mu s, p, and the source q determine the radiance l, and we know it's uniquely determined. We can generate photon biographies from the physics by initiating a photon from the source q, applying Beer's law to understand how absorption causes attrition, law, exponential decay, and scattering causes also an exponential decay in a given direction because, but the photon is not lost, it's just redirected. Uh, and then we, after launch, we select the distance for the first event to take place, which could be absorption or scattering, and then if it's scattering, if it's absorption, we end it, perhaps, and go on to the next photon. If it scatters, we redirect it through the scattering phase function, P, and let it continue. And from that point on, we alternate sampling between the distances traveled and collision redirection until one of the several events that terminates takes place, absorption, escape through some exit, reflect whatever the ge geometric shape. It may not be a slab. <clears throat> um, I'm going to talk about a, a point here that's very, very important, and that is a slight variant on what we call analog Monte Carlo, something a little more sophisticated that has much more flexibility and utility. Uh, analog, as the name suggests, in each photon represents one unit of radiant energy that doesn't vary throughout the life history, the biography. So it's, it's launched with one unit weight. It doesn't change by any of the events that take place. If it's absorbed, one unit of radiant energy is lost. Now in Beer's Law, we see that we can reduce uh, exponentially, according to mu a, the, uh, the radiance, that it falls off exponentially. And that suggests uh, a different way of keeping track of statistics of photons. Um, we can either well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still talking about analog. So in analog, how do you select the distances between intercollision? How do you select intercollision distances between events? According to this law, 
um, mu t e to the minus mu t times s. S is the dif dif distance traveled. So that ma mimics Beer's law. And to sample from it, you would integrate that exponential function from zero to an upper limit and solve for the upper limit as a function of a random number. It's a kind of a golden rule of Monte Carlo, the way you sample from any probability density function. Um, and that'll produce the correct total mean free path. So if you integrate s times this function with respect to s, you get, you get 1 over mu t. Changes in direction are governed by the phase function. And mu naught is the cosine of the scattering, ang the polar angle theta, the scattering angle between the initial direction and the exit direction, the cosine of that is mu zero. Uh, and photon biographies contribute a tally of one either to absorbed energy, reflectance, or transmittance in the 1D case. So that's the analog situation. And now uh, a weighted Monte Carlo simulation does not allow photons to be absorbed. Each photon in, in this uh, simulation models a beam of continuously or even discreetly varying radiant intensity with unit initial intensity. So yet, at launch, it has a weight of one, one radiant. And energy is conserved as before, but distances between successive scattering only events are selected from mu s, e to the minus mu s times little s, which produces the correct scattering mean free path. So that means when we sample this exponential, we're only moving particles between successive scattering events. How then do we account for the absorption if we're not allowing it on a collision? Well, what we can do is take the weight, this weight here, which is the weight of absorbed energy density along a track of length s. So as the particle travels between scattering events, it is continuously being attenuated through absorption. And its final weight then is the weight it started with times this exponential which now involves mu a. So, and then changes in direction, again, are determined from the scattering phase function. And in this case, photon biographies deposit the correct weights for absorption, reflectance, and transmittance, as you might hope. And your hope would be realized here. I have here a couple of flowcharts which are really things that you'll look at maybe later when, you, when you're at home and you're wanting to understand the differences. It's not that the flowcharts are very different or difficult, but the analog over here on the right just uh, shows you weight of one. You sample the source at launch. Then you sample the distance. Then you move the photon. You ask if it's still in or outside of the medium. If it's outside the medium, you increment reflectance and transmittance tally and launch a new. If it's still in, you ask if it's absorbed. If it is, you start another photon. If it isn't, you scatter. No change in weight. Here, you start with a weight of one, you sample the source, you sample the distances from a different exponential, which involves only the scattering. You move the photon a distance according to that and ask the same question if you're in or out. Uh, if you're in, you update the absorbed energy tally. 
with that exponential I showed you on the previous slide. And then you change the photon direction. You keep doing that. So in this case, you can't absorb discrete photons. You, you can interpret this as an absorption continuously. And you can look at regions of the, of the geometry and ask yourself how much absorption took place here. Because it's, it's known and it's recorded if you want to keep track of it. But there isn't any physical an analog absorption. And therefore, all the weighted random walks end in reflection or transmission. Uh, here's, the, here's the point I asked, in, uh, the question I asked in the beginning slide. How do you know if you're doing one of these non-standard simulations that it's correct, that it's actually solving the right transport problem. <clears throat> well, in fact, there are infinitely many I equivalent stochastic solution models for every radiative transport equation. So there's discrete absorption weighting, as it's called, where you de-weight only at discrete collision points. Uh, I just described what I would call continuous absorption weighting in which you de-weight continuously along the photon pass. Well, how do you know that you're, cho you, you're modeling the RTE that you think you are? Each model produces an approximate solution, the sample mean and a sample standard deviation. If we can show that the sample mean converges rigorously to the solution as the number of photons launched goes to infinity. That means that the variance or standard deviation goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Then a n is called an unbiased estimator. Those are the kinds of estimators we favor. Uh, not all estimators by any stretch of the imagination are unbiased. Intuitively plausible estimators may not possess this property. It's strange, but you can think of things that seem to mimic the physics and aren't quite right. And conversely, many estimators that are developed strictly from mathematical considerations they're not only unbiased, but they give rise to larger uh, figures of merit than more intuitive choices. So this is one of the tools we have to design a Monte Carlo which is computationally more efficient than analog, uh, is to look at non-standard kinds of ways of generating random walks and keeping track of them. Well, here's this whole story on one slide. Uh, it talks about the fidelity of the stochastic model, that is the Monte Carlo probabilistic model, to the physical or analytic model described by the radiative transport equation and its parameters. Well, the, the elements of a probabilistic model, bear with me here, <laughs> are a space, a sample space. Those of you who have taken probability theory know a sample space is a space of samples, OK? And the elements of my sample space are going to be complete photon biographies. Each little b is such a biography. The random variable, C, the second component of a probabilistic model, is a random variable that we hope is going to be, or we design to be unbiased, which associates a certain weight, a tally, if you will, with each biography B, depending on the random walk undergone by the biography, a weight accumulates. That's the weight whose averages, those are the weights whose averages form the approximation 
Uh, and M, finally, this is the third component, is a probability measure. Think of it as a, um, a unit density function that stretches over the whole big space B. So it gives you the relative likelihood, given your rules for generating random walks, the relative likelihood of generating a particular biography. Now, there are infinitely many of them, and so each probability is measure zero. Each, each one occurs with probability measure zero. But you have to talk about a probability density function, which has to be integrated to give you the measure associated with a collection of photons. Okay. Um, the fact that it's a probability measure means that the measure of the whole space is one, the theoretical expected value of a random variable is the integral with respect to the measure. It's just the first moment over the sample space. And so it's the exact average value of C with respect to the generating measure. And in what sense, I ask, are these models equivalent? Well. This, this uh, line of equalities tells you what you need to know. Uh, they're equivalent if the expected value, the theoretical expected value, which is this, integration over B, the probability space, is the same as the integration over the model space, the gamma cross S2. Gamma is the phase, physical phase space. S2 is the sphere of unit directions of the multiplying weighted function applied to the radians. So this is the solution I'm asking for, and I really want for this to be equal to that. And if that's the case, the estimator will be unbiased. Now, there are a whole bunch of estimators, early derivations in the field that are proven to be unbiased, and you can find them in this uh, book. Uh, and so it's a question really of doing, uh, proving a new estimator is unbiased, is to take an estimator which has been established to be unbiased and, and interpret the new one as a relative of the old one or modify the old one to get the new one. That's sort of the way it is, like stepping into a pond over different rocks. <laughs> a few of the rocks have been planted and the others are ones you want to go to. So here's a reprise. Now, coming back to the uh, stack of uh, software that's in the VTS uh, system. Uh, the bottom layer, as I said much earlier, determines the problem input. In this green stack, you decide whether you want an EM, an RTE, or some kind of an SDA, or a PN solver, a higher order SDA. That produces a solution, the radiance. And in this lecture, we focused on stochastic right here in the middle. That covers a lot of ground, actually. It works for models that are close to a scattering mean free path from sources where you, in that case, would need to treat uh, other, other uh, EM effects. Um, and out indefinitely into the domain, which is normally diffuse. So you don't have to worry about <coughs> diffusion if you're doing transport. It's rigorously correct for all sizes that are large enough. <coughs> the analysis layer, uh, as uh, Vasan hinted, I think, examines the sensitivities of forward solutions to explore inverse solution prospects. At least that's one function it performs. Um, the sensitivities are the rates of change of the output with respect to the parameters that, whose sensitivity you're interested in. And uh, 
we have a technique of solving inverse problems using Monte Carlo uh, that is able actually to calculate these derivatives through an analytic formula based on the estimator. So that's a very powerful tool. Visualization is used all throughout the game to see what kind of output we're looking at. And finally, the optimization layer uh, at the top solves the nonlinear inverse problem. So it's something like a least squares um, fit. So now let me look ahead a little bit, as I said I would, at inverse solutions. There are two that are already in the VTS. I mention these particularly, the table lookup model, which is simple but uh, useful. And then based on uh, 1D models, inverse adding doubling, which will be talked about from a practical point of view on Wednesday. I'm going to just outline the ideas involved. And then finally, the stochastic model I just alluded to uh, based on perturbation and differential Monte Carlo. <clears throat> Uh, of course, the challenges are by now familiar. Uh, we, don't, we don't expect a necessarily unique solution for the inverse problem. And we'll also find out when we study a little bit more that uh, standard diffusion cannot distinguish between the effects of the scattering cross-section and G, the first anisotropy. It, they, they're coupled, cemented together in the standard diffusion approximation through mu s prime, the product of the two. And higher order solvers, Pn, which get the first n angular moments, exhibit a similar limitation. There's a similarity theory which says that you can get up to n separations, but the next ones are coupled together and you can't separate them. And so inverse problems uh, we know are inherently very ill-conditioned. Okay, so um, in a lookup table approach, I've tried to mimic the notation I introduced earlier. I is an input set, O is an output set. We have N, uh, D detectors uh, with index J. Um, we repeatedly would solve forward problems with different input parameters until the solution matches the measured output or interpolate in the table to find the best match. So you generate a table of inputs and opposite that a table of outputs. It takes a long time if you're doing it by Monte Carlo. And it's naive, but it works. You can extract the inverse solution by locating it in the table or by optimization. How do you get at the error in a case like that? You need a metric of some sort. And the usual metric uh, to judge how far the computed values are from the measured ones is this relative error M1 which uh, takes the difference between the calculated value and the measured value and divides it by the measured value and adds that to the difference between, this is for uh, uh, reflectance and this is for transmission, the two, the same two values uh, calculated and measured relative. So it, it, this assumes the measurement errors for these two measurements are roughly equal. If not, the factors should be introduced that tell you what the unlikelihood or likelihood of getting the measurements you got is. So you have to introduce the variance of the measurements, which you know and can do. And that's an inverse weighting function. And that, that least squares minimization gives you a figure uh, that measures the error in the table lookup. 
And more generally, if you have a whole vector of parameters to find optical properties, we minimize the sum over all of them of this relative measure, square it to get a second order quantity, and call that chi-square. Um, I'm going to kind of give short shrift to the uh, this one because Wednesday will be talked about to some considerable extent, and maybe it's okay if I omit it. Um, you'll hear more about it, uh, and uh, there are many references. Anyway, it goes back to the. 1D model problem I showed you before. Um, and here is uh, some output. I just want to talk about the next two figures. <clears throat> One of the things you'll learn when you solve inverse problems is that it's important to select uh, the axes of your inverse space in, in as or, orthogonal to each other as possible. And here you can see what's being plotted is the total reflection and transmission of a refractive index matched slab as a function of albedo and anisotropy for a fixed unscattered transmission value of 10%. This is taken from Scott Prowl's paper. Uh, you can see from the intersections the clarity of them out here and the jamming together of them here that uh, things are going to get worse right in here in this area. But there is a unique solution. The curves cross in a unique point. The regions where the solution, the inversion is likely to be more difficult will be these compressed regions. Um, and again, I refer to similarity theory can be used to facilitate the problem representation because what you do is you go from the albedo and the optical thickness uh, and the thickness to the reduced albedo defined in this way involving G and the reduced optical thickness defined in this way. Uh, and then you get a, an improved picture. Again, this is a total reflection and transmission as a function of the redu This slab is mismatched, so we have uh, not identical uh, refractive indices as a function of albedo, reduced albedo, and reduced optical thickness. Scattering is assumed isotropic. And what we note is the improved separation of inverse solutions when you have used these reduced optical parameters. So the, these ideas are, have geometric content, and they also have algebraic content, however you like to think about them. You've probably seen them in one way or another before. Um, I do want to spend a few minutes with this uh, very powerful perturbation stochastic model. Uh, it's a very general approach. It uses Monte Carlo to formulate a model that treats um, any number of input quantities using weighted Monte Carlo as uh, in this lecture earlier. Uh, the model is implemented by generating a single set of baseline photons and banking that set. You store this set of base, baseline photons. And you post-process the stored biographical data and use least square optimization to determine the best fitting values. By post-process, I mean you apply the other input parameters, 
So for example, if you want to uh, understand how the inverse problem varies with the wavelength of the light that's launched, you could launch a set of biographies at some sort of mid-ish, mid-wavelength, and then you could stretch using the weighted Monte Carlo. You could say, well, if the frequency were thus and so, I would have to reweight the particle random walks. The formulas are written down in papers we've published of how you do that. And this gives you a true estimate of the perturbed uh, reflectance and transmittance. And the formulas can also be differentiated, the, the estimators. So you get, you get a full, uh, robust model of solving inverse problems by Monte Carlo that's unrestricted except for it is a true perturbation method that means that when uh, the perturbation gets too large, it may be less efficient to solve it this way than to solve two independent Monte Carlo simulations. So there's a crossover point, and uh, it's a complicated theoretical issue what that depends on and just how it depends on all the properties of the problem. So my last slide is this summary and take-home messages. Uh, the transport equation uh, produces a stochastic model that's uh, very useful because it's general uh, and its FOM measures the computational efficiency of Monte Carlo simulations, not just the error. Uh, there are lots of stochastically equivalent simulations based on Monte Carlo with different uh, figures of merit. Uh, fast inverse problem solutions can be based on formula-based exact solutions or cable lookup, which is fast. But for general solutions, any geometry, fully heterogeneous, arbitrary refractive indices, Inverse solutions based on perturbation Monte Carlo can be used and are very effective. And then the key message about that is that you only need a single set of photon biographies plus a modest amount of additional computation in post-processing those biographies. And you get a nice robust inverse solver and that'll be talked about in day four, Thursday. Uh, so with that, and then the last, finally, when you've gotten all the way to the end, you've used all the VTS tools, help, hopefully, and he'll have learned something about how each should be used and in what circumstances. So I'm going to close there and uh, in, invite questions. Thank you for the great talk. I have uh, several questions. So, please spe speak up as much as you can, if you okay. would. So, I have uh, several questions. So, um, what I understand is you have a uh, two kind of uh, Monte Carlo analog Monte Carlo and weighted uh, Monte Carlo. In uh, the difference is on the in the weighted you don't have a option. You have a coefficient and you track it uh, at the function of distance or time. So. Well, you don't, you don't have a continuous option. What yeah. you have are several discrete options, yeah. really. Uh, certain tried and true methods like continuous absorption weighting and discrete absorption weighting. Uh, there are other uh, ways of introducing weights and different from what I've mentioned, and they have to do with uh, other fundamental processes. For example, neutron, if there's production, then you can introduce a weight for that. You can also split weights, make independent particles of each of half weight of the mother particle, two daughter particles of half weight. 
and and proliferate a region felt to be more important that way. So there are a lot of ways of using this technique. Okay, so my first question is, what is the, the advantage of the second, and you already... Uh, the question is... is what is the advantage of weighted uh, Monte Carlo comparison? Well, I think it, the advantage is that, as I said, it, it can and often does produce larger figures of merit. So it gives you computational advantages in terms of efficiency. That's the main thing about it, the main advantage. And uh, at the, the last um, section, you, you mentioned about the perturbation Monte Carlo, in which you, have, you need, at the beginning, sending a, a set of initial photon, and you post-processing to... So yeah, it, it, yeah I, it, it needs to be uh, described in a more detailed way than I did for it to be really understood. But basically, you generate a fixed set, we call it a baseline set of photon biographies and store those and store information about them. And then you ask of that data set a variety of what if questions. What if my tissue properties were different in this small way? That can be answered by changing the weights in a post-processing sense. And the post-processing is quick compared to the generation of independent sets of random walks. So it's a very efficient method. It gives greater relative accuracy because of the correlation. And it has many advantages, and we use it a lot. So uh, you have other questions about it, or have I answered your question? Yeah, so my question is, um, so when you launch the initial photon, I bet that, I, I think that you already know what is the result that you expected, and then after the post-processing, you scale it? Or what, what is the, the, the purpose of sending an in initial set of photon? So that you can scale it later for, for post-processing, right? Uh Another method for doing this? Do you mean a, or, uh, not a perturbation method? No, my, my question is, what is the purpose of sending the first initial uh, set of photon? And uh, What's the purpose of it? Yeah. Well, the purpose of it is to save a lot of time and gain accuracy. If you only process one set of 10,000 random walks, the, that may take, let's say, two hours. It may take 10 minutes or five minutes to post-process it. If for each what-if question, you get an answer in a few minutes. Not only that, but the answers are correlated with each other in a positive way. And that's an advantage when you look at the variance. So you get a faster calculation and more accurate. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Hi, um, could you comment a little bit on the uh, practical limitations of adding geometry to these solutions? Like, I know there's a lot of work on multi-layered models, but like, have you considered other geometries that might be a little more complicated than that, and sort of what stops you from like adding almost infinite complexity, I guess? So you want me to say a little more about adding doubling or about other geometries and other techniques? Just ge geometries of Monte Carlo in general, yeah, like yeah. adding maybe inclusions or right. things that kind well, of... Well, there have been studies of every body part using Monte Carlo. Brain, uh, neonates, uh, you know, uh, just about anything you can think of has been measured and the kind of the standard gold standard a laboratory way of validating a model is to use, run a Monte Carlo that's known to be faithful to it. Um, Devasan, you'd like to add something to that, I'm sure. Well, I think Michael was, I think if I understood your question correctly, is that you're thinking what limits or what are the limitations or what are the complexities added when wanting to introduce heterogeneity 
into a, into a Monte Carlo simulation. So I think, and you know, there are many groups that have developed Monte Carlo simulations in various mesh geometries, and um, or in what is an otherwise homogeneous geometry with specific inclusions with specific geometrical characteristics. And the key element, I think, that um, reduces, say, the efficiency of these methods relative to a homogeneous is that one has to always check when you, after you uh, launch the photon from one scattering event onto the other scattering event, are you crossing a boundary in the medium and if so, the optical properties may change across that boundary. And then you have to reweight the absorption across that path length that is faithful to the difference in the optical properties of those two regions. Moreover, if, this, if you're doing, say, a continuous absorption weighting um, or analog, which is based where the path lengths are based on the local scattering properties. If the scattering is different, then the total lengths of those segments have to be accounted for properly. And so there's always an additional bit of computational overhead with respect to figuring out, OK, in each photon path between successive scattering events, have I crossed a boundary? If I have, then how do I do the reweighting? And that tends to, you take a computational hit uh, it, the more boundaries you have to consider uh, in those simulations. Nonetheless, they're very successful and very, um, you know, uh, fairly reasonably efficient implementations of, of such. But it's much easier dealing with that than in an analytic or even right. a, yeah, analytic uh, representation. D did I address? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. perfect. Okay. Thank you. So anything else along those lines or other lines? Well, if not, I think we can uh, adjourn for this. Oh, you have an announcement? Yeah, well, just a, just a couple of announcements. Okay. okay. Let's thank Jerry again. So just want to give you a preview. I think lunch should be waiting for us at the Laser Institute. So. Um, you know, you'll just follow the crowd. It's maybe a five to 10 minute walk from here. But then I just want to give you a preview. So we'll have an hour or so for lunch. And then uh, Carol Hayakawa and Lisa Malenfond will introduce you to the software system that you'll be using this afternoon and maybe some elements you're going to be using later this week. And then you're going to go through not only two laboratory exercises. The first is more clearly matched to the first lecture where you're going to be able to um, play with a tool that allows you to visualize the absorption scattering properties of tissue and their spectral dependence. Um, and that tool will be used later on in the, in the workshop. And then secondly, you're going to do a series of Monte Carlo simulations, and you're going to explore these issues of the difference between analog versus weighted Monte Carlo visually, as well as understanding their figures of merit. And embedded in that will also allow you to visualize these light fields, which is also something that we talked about in the first lecture. And so this, you kind of just, you know, as Jerry said, taking the first few steps into the pond, and then we'll, we'll go full-fledged a little later on this week. But hopefully you find that useful, and then we'll, we'll have discussion uh, of those exercises after that. So I'll see you guys uh, just down the way. Okay, thank you.